All right, today I'm going to give you the long um, anticipated lecture on anti Semitism that I haven't given yet. So um, I want to especially insist uh, when we're discussing anti Semitism on the difference between anti Judaism and anti Semitism. If people say it's been the same thing, the Jews have always had a hard time or have been given a hard time. Uh, in the Middle Ages, today, even in the olden days when the temple was destroyed, that is in itself um, a myth of origin, where the persecution that is real enough serves as a uh, an ahistoric constitutive factor of the Jewish people. Certainly, it is a fact of life uh, to be persecuted and to be driven out and to be suspicious, or to be the, the, the the target of suspicion, but it is important if you do want to take anti-Semitism seriously to recognize that the modern variety that we're dealing with today is an entirely different animal from the anti-Judaism of the Middle Ages. So one is based on religion, and it is in a time when the racism that is inherent in anti-Semitism, where Jews are defined as biologically different on a molecular level, so to speak, on a genetic level, was simply not available to people in the Middle Ages. It is a way of thinking that emerges with modern science and technology as they're being put to work in the service of imperialism, thereby creating real differences in power, wealth, et cetera, between people uh, in Europe and other continents, between Christians and others, and thereby creates a need a functionality for having ideologies that explain why this these differences created by imperialism are natural, healthy, and good. So that's the purpose of modern racism and biological science that says who you are is to a large extent determined by your biology and creates an inescapable destiny for you and limits your possibilities that is a thought not available in the Middle Ages. One practical difference, although if you're at the receiving end of it, again, the experiential level doesn't perhaps make that much of a difference. If they come for you because of your religion or if, you, if they come for you because of your race. But in the Middle Ages, <clears throat> at least in theory, there was the path to conversion. Um, there was always the assumption that you could uh, convert and become a Christian. Although in the in practice, in the Spanish Inquisition, oftentimes this was a deathbed conversion um, and forced. And the person who put you on the deathbed was the very person who wanted you to convert. So, um, but there is no possibility for assimilation, for abandoning your Jewishness, as it were, as the Nazis were eager to point out when they made all residents of Germany trace their ancestry back multiple generations to figure out what percentage, what, uh, what fraction Jewish, if any, they were. And then if you were one eighth or less, if you had one great grandparent or fewer who were Jewish, you were good to go as a normal German, as long as you didn't intermarry with Jews and, and thickened the blood, so to speak. And that was the Nuremberg race laws that formalized it. You might notice here a comparatively liberal approach to racism if compared to the American South, which was governed by a so-called one blood, one drop rule. The blood is considered black if there is one black ancestor anywhere in the line. But the idea is the same. Now, um, when you consider racism in general as a form of scapegoating, then um, you imply that maybe there is something contingent in the stereotype. Maybe it is something you can make up at will. The point, however, is that with both, with the two main uh, defining types of racism um, that capture the popular imagination, anti-Black and anti-Jewish, the content of the stereotype is not arbitrary. It is needed to justify specific content, 
that is needed to make sense of observations in a world that is put together a certain way if you want that world to persist as it is and yet are looking for some kind of outlet for discontent, then this is going to be, with variations on the theme, this is going to be the specific content of your stereotype. So um, when it comes to Jews, we've discussed Moshe for Stone, we've discussed Adorno and Horkheimer, and both link anti-Semitism to capitalism and the need for people to come to terms with the somewhat amorphous yet real power structure that capitalism creates, especially in a way where it always seems like somebody is out to get you, but you can't quite hit it down. I mean, this really is the equivalent to the, the thinking about Jews, that the content of anti-Semitism really is the equivalent to that, to that gnawing sense that catches up with everybody in a capitalist society that somebody might be out to get you, but you can't quite pin it down. Um, you could say this is value. You could say this is commodity production. You could say it's the world market, or you could try to personify it, to try and fight a group of people who are the consciously malicious agents like the World Economic Forum, the Jews, the Bilderberg Group, the Rothschilds or whatever. So there are two very different approaches here to dealing with capitalism and the legitimate sense of unease and victimhood it creates in people. Um, one is to explain it as a social system that follows a logic where even the people who are in command are not at liberty to make decisions at will as they please, but they are just as much caught up in the logic of the system or a much more voluntaristic approach that says, these are people who have the choice to just ditch this whole evil social system tomorrow, yet for their own personal enrichment and gratification, they keep carrying on. Why? Because the evil, possibly the even space aliens and some variations of conspiracy theory, but for anti-Semitism uh, and all these conspiracy theories, I would argue, where you have where you have people attributing the logic of capitalism to the deeds of a conscious conspiracy, a world conspiracy, are structurally anti-Semitic, are detrimentally opposed to an anti-capitalist, to a Marxist or socialist analysis that insists that it is a social structure that can very well do, not that it's free of agents doing things malicious, but it doesn't require them. It is built into the system as it is set up, that it doesn't deliver and that it has inhumane consequences, uh, but it doesn't require a command center of evil people. So if your theory of capitalism requires there to be a command center of evil people, you have a structurally anti-Semitic theory of capitalism. They're both anti-capitalist theories, but they're distinct in that one explains it and the other usually ends up justifying it. So all the stuff here that people think about Jews, and when we read Henry Ford, we saw that he spells it out in his short text on the international Jew and, his, and the danger that this group poses to America, um, that they rule the world even though they're weak, they're really inferior. Um, they're not about the concrete. They're not the ones who go out there and fell trees and build railroads. They're the ones who are sitting in a back room, counting money, cackling, and then you know referring to a law book to justify why they get to do that. Um, and in a classical move of attributing to your racial other what you're doing, um, the idea that Jews are dangerous because they're racist, because they treat others as less. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, when anti-Semitism once again was running rampant in Russia, and you had a revival of these ideologies throughout Eastern Europe, the um, idea that the Russian nation was in such bad shape after this transition was because the Jews were doing this. They've always had it out for the Russians and so forth, was widespread. 
Um, and there were people who would go back to the protocols, this forgery, the protocols of the elders of Zion, to say, see here, it says there, um, you can do these things to the Gentiles because they're not like us. They're at a lower level from us. And this, but this, the stereotype is not, like I said, arbitrary. You could not switch it out with another group, as Pastone argues, you can't do that. It's the specific position of Jews in relation to the emerging capitalist world market, a story of wrong place, wrong time. But it is also that what the anti-Semite says about Jews applies often in a sick and twisted way to capitalism as a social system, except we now personify it in this book. So if you look at the Middle Ages, certainly anti-Judaism served for stereotyping. It served for, as it were, the consolidation of power, nation-making. You could even call it ethnic cleansing um, for deflecting blame for catastrophic social events onto a group of outsiders. All of that is well honed by the ruling class clergy and nobility in the Middle Ages. Um, and yet, the crucial element where you actually have the understanding that the plague is not ca caused by miasmas, these invisible uh, agents, but is rather an infectious disease transmitted by rats. Um, this is, or actually it's bacteria, isn't it? Um, this is something that would, would require a knowledge about biology that then also um, would enable people to think in terms of a race that is something biologically defined. And of course, this biological science, the application of science and technology, especially when it comes to imperialism, consider, for instance, the connection here, the discovery <coughs> of microorganisms, the discovery of infection makes it possible to develop uh, treatments and vaccines that are then administered to Europeans who go into the last places in the tropics that had previously biologically, so to speak, resisted European colonization because any potential colonizer stepping foot on African soil would have been very likely to succumb to malaria very quickly. So once you have quinine, once you have hospitals for tropical diseases, once you have the scientific knowledge of those things, it suddenly becomes possible. And so in the 1880s, you get the scramble for Africa, you get the partitioning of Africa. You also have the French going into Indochina, the more tropical parts of, um, of Asia. All of what is enabled because of these advances in biological science as they're being applied for the purpose of global conquest and domination. Um, but of course, it is an outcome of the enlightenment. We've talked about this before, about freeing science and reason from subservience to the church. The problem, however, is, of course, that then they become subservient to capital. This is another argument you've, saw, you've seen in Horkheimer and Adorno in the dialectic of enlightenment. But they insist it is not an argument against the enlightenment and its potential to liberate people from the compulsion of nature and from domination, political and social, to become free and agents of their own destiny. It is just an argument against capitalism that even the enlightenment is current against its own original purpose and potential by it. But be that as it may, for the history of Jews in the West, the enlightenment is a, a double-edged sword. It's a turning point in that it introduces the idea that belonging to a community is not defined by your religious belonging. So um, at the time that government becomes the business of the people, that you have republics, it also no longer becomes the business of the priests and of kings who govern in God's name. And citizenship, therefore, this idea of the person as a participant in the state is stripped of any exterior markers like religion, race, and potentially, you know, gender, ethnicity, and all those things. That is implied in the concept of citizenship. If you live in the place, you have full and equal political rights. 
you have been endowed with these rights by your creator. They're inherent and you can't lose them. Everybody has them equally. You might still, depending on your theorist, have to develop them, but you have them. And that applies to Jews. So for the first time in Pennsylvania, <clears throat> after the revolution, here you have a state, a colony that includes Jews in full and equal citizenship during the American Revolution. And then eventually this spreads, Maryland has full Jewish citizenship too, and voting rights at the end of the 1780s, and other states uh, follow suit. Then in the French Revolution too, citizenship is unlinked from religious um, membership. And of course, uh, there is a tension there, and by the end, um, they don't go back to ha having only Catholics be proper citizens, but even today in France, there is an organization of the Jews of France that plays a semi-official role in the state. So they go back to recognizing religion as something that is a business of the state, but something that you have to protect, and yet that it doesn't limit you in your ability to become, say, an army officer a university professor, a doctor, um, or a politician. And in the countries where um, Jews are then free to take positions in society, they often end up doing that at the same time as places like France and Britain become imperial powers. So get a question? Yes, so you're saying that they would receive like certain uh, representation no matter what, or how does that house work for uh, the individuals in France? No, uh, that like as citizens, everybody is just French and equal. Okay. But there is um, a recognition that the, the Catholic Church has enjoys recognition by the state as an official entity oh. with rights. It's not just a private business of individuals. And in the same way, Jews have that too. Okay. <clears throat> so if you have a concord that between the French Republic and the Vatican, there's something equivalent be between the Jewish community and the French government. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Don't ask me about the details, but that has been going on. And I also don't know, which would be interesting, if the same is true for Protestants in France, for, for Muslims, and whatever else. Um, so the French Republic recognizes that there are religious differences at the same time as saying that this does not in any way shape your, um, your rights as a citizen. We talked about the hep hep pogroms already, which, were, um, which happened when Jews took the invitation seriously to settle in places where they had previously been included, excluded, which coincided after the end of the Napoleonic Wars with economic and ecological crisis. Um, you might have heard about the, the year without a summer, um, which caused harvest failure because of a volcanic eruption in Southeast Asia. Um, I think that was in 1816. The aftermath of that, the panic of 1819, uh, economic and ecological crisis combined uh, was then often blamed on Jews who were driven out of these towns where they had settled just a few years ago. Um, and the emancipation of Jews in Germany after 1815, after the Congress of Vienna, was half-hearted <coughs> anyway, because the mayor of my hometown, uh, Johann Smith, had insisted in changing the language in the, in the closing document from Jews get full rights in the states of the Germanic Confederation to Jews, Jews get full rights by the states of the Germanic Confederation, making it not mandatory, but discretionary. And many states use that to not give those full rights. But in places like France and England, um, people with a Jewish background managed to rise to some of the command heights of this financial and military apparatus that goes and conquers the rest of the world. So whether it is Benjamin Disraeli, who is uh, on and off prime minister in Britain, whether it's the Rothschilds, who are um, bankers, investment bankers in France, and others, 
Um, and then much later in Germany, Jews really only enter into the top tiers of government in the 1920s. And at that point, it is already tied into the rise of, of, of fascism. But this is one of the main um, arguments against the Republic, where conservative merchants who have long dealt with the government, with the central government, never been quite felt understood by it, uh, really reached the end of their tether when their counterpart in Berlin to negotiate with for, for trade policy is not just a woman, but a Jewish woman with a doctorate from a university. That is when they decide that the Reich, the German Empire, has gone woke. Um, this is the end of it, and somebody needs to do something about it. Um, and these are this is a group of people who is considered, you know, cosmopolitan liberals uh, in the German context, merchants, Hanseatic merchants. <coughs> As citizenship is implemented, as people receive equal rights in these societies, in many places, um, the nation, the self-governing body of the people, ends up being defined as not the Jews. So in Germany, for instance, which is a special case of nation making, it is more ethnic than in France, it is less democratic than in France, is less capitalist than in Britain, um, but it is anti-Semitic almost from the start. And one of the leading representatives of German intellectuals who provide the justification for the German empire as a nation state is the historian Heinrich von Kreitschke, who writes a well-received and famous essay called The Jews Are Our Downfall. And um, explaining why Germany has to become one in opposition to Jews. Um, in this sense, that Jews are an alien, a disturbing element, a subversive element, that this is based on their biology, because in many cases, when you have Jewish citizens of a middle-class background, they usually converted to Christianity. They stopped going to the temple by 1800. Um, they don't necessarily see themselves as Jewish, religiously speaking, um, but certainly the anti-Semites see them as such and won't stop doing that just because they've stopped going to the temple. So um, in these places where these groups mix, where you have upper middle class citizens, um, there, you have uh, the first examples of exclusion. The exclusive places like that are, you know, it's they're exclusive anyway, because you can only go there if you're rich. Like Saratoga and Borkum, the spas in Germany and in uh, upstate New York. Um, and then later on, it goes down the ladder. It goes to the tennis club, and the country club. It goes to the public pool and the public park. Um, Certainly, it extends to the universities, attending which is an essential prerequisite for having any kind of a career in this country. The Jews are told, this is not for you. So um, in 1867 or 69, Joseph Seligman, the banker, who was almost single-handedly responsible for American uh, success in the Civil War, for Union success, or selling the war bonds is the guy who is first told in Saratoga, you can't come here anymore. You've been attending here for 10 years, 10 summers, but this is it. And even France, where uh, in Europe at least, Jewish citizenship was first a, a thing, a hundred years after that, you get the Dreyfus affair, uh, which we previously discussed, where a member of the French general staff is accused of treason, is accused of selling the building plans, the blueprints to the French military fortifications on the border with Germany to German military intelligence. And when it comes out that somebody did that, Dreyfus, who is the only Jew on the general staff, and he's in charge, I want to say, of artillery, he is accused of that 
and expelled, dishonorably discharged, imprisoned, and whatnot, when in fact it turned out that the person on the general staff who was in charge of fortifications and who had access to those plans that were sold and whose handwriting was on the documents intercepted with the German embassy was a young French nobleman with gambling debt. Um, so, and yet the, the Catholic right-wing French press never stopped saying and believing, presumably, that Dreyfus did it, that the Jew must have done it. And you have similar uh, events in Austria, in Germany, where from incidents where anti-Semites blame Jews for social changes that are caused by capitalist market socialization, uh, give rise to political parties, like Karl Lurge as mayor of Vienna, is the first successful populist right-wing politicians in Europe um, or the anti-Semitic party in Germany. And I left off this list, but it should be on here, uh, Tom Watson, who was an Atlanta politician in, in Georgia. He was a member of the People's Party, like the populists, uh, had been a Democrat, had been a segregationist, came to the realization that his social base, poor white farmers, was not well served by segregation. Took the extraordinary step to mobilize at a point when this was already illegal in a black and white alliance of poor farmers for land reform, for political reform, got himself elected to the US Senate as a populist. But when that movement collapsed, and was integrated into the Democratic Party, he struck out as a newspaper editor in Atlanta. And there, the propaganda by his newspaper was largely responsible <coughs> for the lynching of Leo Frank, who was a Jewish textile manufacturer falsely accused of rape of a white teenage girl um, in a motive that is so very much part and parcel of anti-Semitism it never goes very far before you get to the false accusations of pedophilia, child abuse, and so forth. Um, so if you're looking at the current wave of anti-trans propaganda and attacks, the idea that you're dealing with quote unquote groomers there, um, it is always the children uh, that are put out there as the, as the ultimate justification for why we really need to to kill these people. Uh, it's all for the good of the children. With this type of ideology, it is very important to remember at any step of the way, uh, not to fall into the liberal uh, upper middle class trap that is easy to fall into if you're in a university because you're surrounded by those people, that this is somehow a question of dumb people doing dumb things or evil people. It's usually a combination of dumb and evil people, which then often comes also implicit or explicit as a matter of uneducated working class. Um, this is in itself a justification ideology. It exculpates that social class that the liberal uh, who theorizes it in this fashion usually belongs to. Of the educated middle class and upper middle class. If you look closely enough, that is exactly the um, the social class in which, from which, anti-Semitism, racism, um, patriarchal gender ideology, and so forth emerge. It doesn't come. It doesn't come bubbling up from the from the swamp of the uneducated uh, backwoodsmen. It it trickles down from Harvard and Yale. Uh, from the Kaiser Wilhelm University in Berlin, from Freiburg, Heidelberg, and other respectable universities. That is where it comes from. And that is from where it is disseminated through the intelligentsia, through the middle class teachers and professors, and so forth. So um, one of the people who first come out and say, 
the races are not variations of the same human theme. The races are like different brands, I mean, different uh, 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 breeds of animals. Is Joseph Arthur de Gobineau, who was a French nobleman, diplomat, highly educated, and so forth, building eventually also on the work of people like Charles Darwin, who were talking about uh, species, about biology as something that determines the success or failure of these species. So social Darwinism um, travels hand in hand with this rise of racial ideology. As a worldview that links uh, or that employs anti-Semitism as a way to explain what's happening with capitalism, Werner Zambard, who we saw Henry Ford quoted in his International Jew, is uh, in 1911, the, a guy who says that Jews did this. Jews were the ones who gave rise to modern capitalism. It's their ethics that determine the shady, harmful ways in which capital does business. These are not good human Christian ethics. No good Christian, certainly no good German would be doing this stuff if not for the influence of the Jews. They set the framework. If you've heard about Max Weber and the Protestant um, work ethic and the spirit of capitalism, you've, you might have heard that book dismissed uh, for various reasons. <clears throat> but you have to keep in mind that it was a counter proposal to uh, people on to these kinds of reactionaries like Zambard, um, who came from the same originally from the same institute for uh, social uh, for social sciences as Weber did, who were going fully racial in their explanation. So Zambard instead, uh, uh, Weber instead insisted that it's about culture, that it's about ideas but it is not built into the racial makeup of a person, whether he's good or bad, greedy or, uh, or not. And then the final element for the global uh, conspiracy of Jews, for the ongoing uh, global conspiracy of Jews is provided by Oswald Spengler, who is the one who is saying the Jews were behind World War I. They played everybody against each other. Uh, they, they were the ones who invented this clash of civilization <coughs> in order to rise above the Gentiles, all of whom owe them money. You saw that when we watched Zeus. I mean, you watched it on your own time. I presume you saw the whole thing. Um, it's very much the idea here that Jews are the powers behind the throne. All the stuff that the Duchy of Württemberg gets up to in, in taking away the rights of their citizens um, when Zeus Oppenheimer is working there as the treasurer, all of that is the doing of the Jews, and it's for their benefit. So once you have all these elements of anti-Semitism in place, what you end up with is an internally coherent, if, of course, not correct, um, not accurate explanation for why the world is this way. Um, it has the convenient effect that if you actually tried to act on it, if you had the power, like the Nazis certainly did, to go and act on that basis, you never fix the world because you haven't analyzed it in a way that actually explains how it really works. You just came up with an internally coherent um, worldview that allows you to make sense of it. But here are the, the main elements of anti-Semitism that come together to make that ideology. And as we saw with Henry Ford, of course, uh, in many ways, you can look at this and say, wait, this actually sounds like capitalism. This does describe what capitalism is and does. Who is doing that? Uh, well, if you are Henry Ford, he's saying it's the Jews doing it, of course. Look, don't look at me and maybe the richest guy alive. 
uh, I may have tens of thousands of people working for me who see me as an evil capitalist, but that's not true. Really, I, my hands are tied. I would love to be um, generous, but the Jews have me by the um, uh, throat and they are forcing me to act in these ways that are evil towards them. But don't join the labor unions because they're also run by the Jews. That's like the ultimate trick. Capitalism is done by the Jews and Bolshevism is done by the Jews to divide Gentiles against each other. If we realized that we had to stick together and fight against the Jews, then we could fix up. So again, what we saw with Pastone, German fascism in its political and economic theory divides capital into the good kind, the concrete value creating kind, productive capital, and that would be people like Henry Ford, manufacturers on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have um, speculative capital that is uh, leeching of the productive labor of others without creating anything of itself. And that's the Jewish part. So it is trying to split a complex that is capitalism into two, um, personifying the bad stuff reifying the good stuff, the concrete, making um, the use value an argument against the exchange value as if these two were not just two aspects of the commodity to begin with. So this is anti-Semitism uh, and its relation to anti-capitalism or capitalism. So it is a mistake just to point this out too, to say that all anti-capitalism is um, structurally anti-Semitic. That would be a mistake. There are critiques of capitalism um, that see it as a social structure and that explain what happens based on the decisions made by actors with or without economic power that are inherently rational and yet lead to or incentivize irrational decisions, even you know, sociopathic ones. I mean, when it comes to the leadership uh, of corporations, but that is not conspiracy. That is the description of how social interactions work. It's a sociological theory of how the capitalist economy works. It doesn't require, in other words, the assumption that there is an actor that is bad or evil, that is like, um, an external uh, conspirator. So these are two different types of, of theories of, 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 of capitalism. The lecture has a few more slides here where I also wanted to talk about the, the Muslim world because in many cases, when we talk about anti-Semitism today, um, it comes, at least it came, the Islamophobia has kind of taken a backseat to the transphobia right now. Um, but it came uh, with an association with Palestinians, perhaps with Al Qaeda. So it seemed worth it going into the history of anti Semitism in the Muslim world, which, as it turns out, doesn't really exist. Uh, there is not a whole lot of anti Jewish uh, or anti Semitic sentiment in the Muslim world until the 19th century. What there is, tends to be imported uh, from the West. And it comes to the Middle East, either through intellectuals, Muslim intellectuals who've, who've gone to school in Paris, London, Berlin, or New York, um, or on the radio waves, uh, like German shortwave radio broadcasting into North Africa and the Levant in 1941 to 1943, um, telling Arabs that they should rise up and throw off the British yoke because the Jews stand behind them. But um, we are out of time and therefore I will not be going.